it's time to begin. So uh, it's a pleasure to have Pankaj Mehta, who's going to give us a tutorial on the Hopfield network and its generalizations. And then uh, for the second half, he will give us, he will give us a, a research talk too. So Pankaj, take it away. All right. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've gotten used to in-person seminars again, where I can see people's faces. So this is going to be, uh, this can be fun. Um, Please, I guess you're not supposed to interrupt with questions, but I don't care if you unmute and ask me questions. I find it better. So in principle, you're supposed to do it in the chat. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm gonna start with is I'm gonna tell you about the Hopfield model. And what's interesting is the Hopfield model is an old model from neuroscience that John Hopfield came up with in the early 1980s. But what I think has been less appreciated in the last few, uh, in the last few, five, seven years is that there's actually been a resurgence in the Hopfield model. There's been a lot of progress. And so I thought this tutorial would be a good excuse for me to tell you about the Hopfield model and also to synthesize all this kind of amazing stuff that's happened just in the last four or five years. And that's what I'm going to try to tell you about. So um, let's start with this kind of very funny thing about associative memory. So this is this example from this neural dynamics book that you can find online. And I'll give you like 20 seconds to stare at this. And, um, you know, you can see that something like 15% of the letters <laughs> are deleted, but you know exactly, you know exactly what this says, right? I find it really amazing that you're able to read this text despite the fact that more than some percentage of the characters are missing. This means that your brain is able to fill in missing information, right? And this is like, you know, we take it for granted that we can do things like this, but this is kind of amazing, right? And so Hoffield was trying to figure out this basic idea of how, if I give you a piece of something, how can I fill in the rest? And so this is this idea of associative memory. And the basic idea is like, say I give you a noisy image, you know, the idea is I wanna create a network with some dynamics such that the fixed point of this network is this kind of attractor or this full image that I want to recreate, right? And this is basically the central idea of all these kind of associative memories and these kind of pop field models. And so what's interesting, of course, is that I don't want to just be able to store one kind of memory or one kind of recall, one kind of pattern. I generally want to store lots and lots of patterns all in the same network. And this was basically the central idea behind the hop field network. So the idea behind the Hopfield network is that you have some what are called neurons, but for our purposes, they'll just be spins. The spins get inputs from all the other spins and each time step, you just update these things. And so the dynamics are states of neurons that are iteratively updated based on the states of all the other neurons. The stored states are generally, the idea of the Hopfield network is the stored states are a minimum of an energy landscape or equivalently a fixed points of this dynamic. And what I think was the really interesting neuroscience inspired thing about this is that the information about the attractors was actually contained in the connections between these neurons, right? So the, the idea is that like what patterns I wanna store is actually contained in the connections between neurons rather than in something else. So let, let, let's unpack each of these three statements. That's gonna be like most of the 20 minutes. Then I'll tell you how in the last five, seven years, the Huffield network, I would say has seen a kind of silent resurgence that unless you've been paying attention to papers in many, many different fields, you don't realize how much progress has been made both in applying this kind of concept of associative memory, as well as generalizing it to new settings. So as I said, the dynamics of the states are iterative. And the basic idea is I have some spins, which I've written here at SI, SJ, right? And the idea is, and this, I, I mostly throughout this talk, I'm gonna do what are called zero temperature updates, which are deterministic updates. And what I'm gonna say is that the state of neuron I at T plus one depends on all the states of all the neurons at time T. And the basic idea is I just linearly sum the state at time T, all the states with some weight matrix WIJ, and then I take the sign. So remember these spins are plus or minus ones. And I can basically start flipping spins according to this dynamics. 
And the basic idea is that you can convince yourself very easily that these dynamics minimize this energy functional here, which is just basically a generalized Ising model, which is just basically I have pairwise interactions between spins with W I W J. I can have an optional field with it, which is this B J. But for most of this talk, I'm going to set B J to zero, right? And the idea is under this dynamics, I'm going to basically flow down this energy landscape. That's what you're supposed to see in the picture on the bottom right. And of course, the idea is that if I'm going strictly downhill at zero temperature, I'm going to get stuck in some minima. You can have global minima, you can have local minima. And all the idea is that I want to tune this matrix WIJ in such a way that I get minima that I care about, patterns that I care about. So this is the basic idea of a hot field network. It's basically interacting spins. There's an energy functional that's minimized under the dynamics. And the information about what, I, what what's really interesting about the hot field network was it's kind of inverted the usual thing. It said, imagine I want to store these patterns. I want to tell you the minima of the landscape. How do I construct a network that gives you that minima? So here is you know, a very simple idea. So imagine I want to store this picture of Homer Simpson, right? So my kids are finally at the age where I can watch the Simpsons with them. And I realize that all the cultural references are wasted on them. It's like all like 1980s cultural references, but it's still fun to rewatch them. But so that's what, so you have these Simpsons, you have this Homer. And I think of Homer because for now, in the beginning, we're just thinking about spins, which are black, you know, plus or minus one. In this case, I'm going to think about black pixels and white pixels. And so now I can represent this Homer by a vector which I'll call P Homer, right? And it's just like, I take this 2D image and I can just flatten it out however I want. It's a vector of plus or minus ones that just tells me each position in the vector corresponds to a pixel. And now what's funny is the hot field construction basically says that let me choose this coupling matrix as just the outer product of this vector, P I P J. So W I J is just literally P I Homer, P J Homer. Then I construct this energy functional here and some magic happens, right? So if I now give an input, which is this kind of masked Homer, I run it through the dynamics. In just one update, at least in this case, I could reconstruct this Homer, right? So this is this kind of idea that I give you a piece of a memory and the dynamics itself fills in the rest. And in particular, I can fill in Homer because I constructed the interactions in the network to store the Homer, right? This is like neurons where the idea is that the synapses basically you know, control the memory, right? But on a more abstract level, it's kind of a very interesting inverse problem where I say, I give you the minima I want. How do I construct a dynamical systems or an energy landscape who minima are the things I wanna store? So this is really fun, but you know, I don't want to store just one state. So imagine I want to store two states, right? And by the way, this is all stolen from this very nice blog entry on modern. It's a very nice blog entry on by some uh, by 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 a very fun Austrian and Norwegian group who have related all these Hoffman models to transformers. I'll touch on that at the end. Um, so now imagine I want to store three things, right? And now what I do is I just make a outer product of all three memories I want to store, right? So I have, uh, I basically sum over three inputs, like I want to store Homer, Marge, and there's a second Marge here, just to show you some weird stuff that can happen. But I can imagine I could corrupt it or do something. But the basic point is now if I put a big bunch of black there, instead of flowing to Homer, I flow to Marge. And if you think for a second, it's because you notice that what it does is it takes this big black spot and it associates that with Marge because Marge has a lot of black, right? Instead of Homer. And so what this happens is that this kind of prescription seems to work well, but, it, it, but the problem of course becomes that if the patterns aren't completely random and independent of each other, there's confusion, right? So for example, if I try to store these patterns, right? If I try to construct, reconstruct the same thing, I get some weird mixture of all the patterns I've stored. And classically in the Hoffield model, this is what's called the spurious state, right? But there's a fundamental lesson to all this. Sorry, I have 25 minutes. So if I'm going fast, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, just interrupt me. So I'm gonna try to give you the essence of the idea and hopefully the mathematics is, the mathematics is actually not that hard of all this stuff. Um, 
So the lesson of all this stuff is that I can store many patterns, but if the patterns have lots of correlations with each other, the attractors can and generically will interfere with each other if there's correlations between things. Because basically I get confused. I say, which, okay, I'm trying to reconstruct this pattern, but there's confusion because there's overlap between these things. And the basic idea is that the noise, that there's effective noise in the dynamics due to interference, right? So let's recall the dynamics. The dynamics is just what I'm going to do is I'm going to update things according to this omega ij. And imagine I initialize at some attractor pi nu, okay? So some attractor nu. So I start at nu and I ask what happens under the dynamics? Well, recall that in the bottom, this is the most math you'll see in this tutorial, I promise you. <laughs> but the basic idea is that I'm going to go back and all I've done is I've plugged in this form of omega ij, right? It's a sum over mu over all patterns. I plug that in in the bottom. I've set b to the zero. And the whole point of all this stuff is that I can separate out this kind of very crazy term, a sum, into a part that comes from when mu equals nu and a part where mu is not equal to nu, all right? That's the basic idea, that I have, I put all the patterns in, and now they're gonna, and what's clear is that because everything is plus or minus one, the part that comes from nu has a one, because it's basically they're the exact same pattern, but there's another part, which is this crazy sum of all these other patterns, and that's exactly, basically noise. Right? That's basically interference between these things because you're basically calculating the overlap of one pattern with all the other patterns. And so the idea is that I basically get, you know, I can take all this out. I basically get the pattern I want with this one, which is the signal, but all the other patterns act as noise. And this noise is going to be larger and larger. You can convince yourself if there's more and more overlaps between these patterns. And that's why you get these kind of funny behavior like this, because the patterns interfere with each other, right? And so the Hoffield model originally stored many patterns, but all the patterns have to be completely uncorrelated with each other because the, because the moment where you get the least interference is where I have random patterns and they're completely uncorrelated with each other. And so what's fun is there's, there's many generalizations that overcome this basic fundamental thing. Like how do I store these memories without having things interfere with each other? even though they're not random. So, you know, just, this is classic spin glass stuff. This is just amazing work from Daniel Amit and Haim and all these guys, classic 1980s things. You can make a phase diagram. And in particular, we've been thinking about the zero temperature updates. So you can replace the sine function with a sigmoid, you know, with a Fermi. But the basic idea is that if I, I, I the thing that controls how many patterns I can store and successfully retrieve is basically the number of stored patterns to the number of neurons I have, the dimensionality of these things. And you know, when I have very few patterns, there's not that much interference. I'm on the left-hand side of this bottom x-axis. For some reason, my mouse is not working, just like I suspected it wouldn't. Um, and uh, and um, you can retrieve stuff. Then as I add more and more patterns, it says the retriever is metastable, which means that, that the patterns correspond to local minima, but not the global minima. And at some point, you get a spin glass transition where the attractors that dominate are these weird mixtures between everything, All right? So that's the generic pattern of the Hoffield model. And what's fun about the Hoffield model, and it's gonna be relevant for the second part of the talk, though most of this is just the, really a tutorial on the Hoffield model, is that I can define these kind of order parameters. So because this is just basically a magnet where spins talk to each other, and usually I think about magnetizations as how much I overlap with the all spin up state or all spin down state. Instead, I can define generalized magnetizations, which tell me how much do I overlap with each magnetization, with each pattern, right? So that I have a magnetization for each pattern. And what's fun, and this is gonna be really important, is the very bottom formula on this slide, which is in terms of these magnetizations, the energy just looks like the sum of the magnetization squared. Right? You can convince yourself because I just plugged in this WIJ. I looked at the public, looked at it. And so this is a very dumb energy in some sense. It just says, calculate the magnetizations with all the patterns. 
and it's negative the sum of that magnitude squared. And what's fun about it is this order parameter basically generalizes the idea of an order parameter in a magnet. And another important thing to understand about the Hoffield model is that this, um, this Hoffield model actually has a completely geometric intuition. Right? The basic idea is that if I look at this coupling matrix, Wij, you see it's just a projector onto the patterns, right? So it's just PU, vector pattern vector outer product with another pattern vector transpose. If the pattern, if the this is like a bra and a cat for those of you that are more physicists, right? It's just the same bra and cat, I sum over all of them. If the patterns are orthogonal, then this coupling matrix is exactly a projector in the literal sense, like P squared equals P, you know. Yes, P squared equals P, like projector, onto the plane spanned by the patterns. And the basic idea is that the energy functional is basically proportional to the magnitude of the outer plane components, right? So everything on the plane has zero energy. Its coordinate system is given by these M mu's. And the energy is just proportional to how far away you are from this plane. So this is another geometric understanding of the Hopfield models, right? So there's many different ways to look at the Hopfield model. This is another way of looking at the Hoffield model that's useful sometimes. So that's basically what I wanted to tell you about the Hoffield model. Again, the idea is that I have this prescription for storing patterns in the couplings. The energy functional is on one hand, just this kind of pairwise interaction. On the other hand, in terms of magnetizations, it's the sum of the magnetizations. Finally, there's this geometric way of looking at this thing where I take the patterns and I just project onto the plane spanned by the patterns. Right? So this is the Hoffield model. And it really works well for storing multiple patterns only if the patterns are orthogonal, right? So if they're really perpendicular to each other. And so what I'm gonna tell you about are some generalizations of the Hoffield model that try to get around these things. So the, oh, the final thing I wanna tell you is that you can see that the number of patterns I can store is actually linear in the number of neurons. So if I have, because you see that this alpha is the number of store patterns over the number of neurons, you see that this, there's this critical value, say 0 0.14, 0 0.15, but it doesn't matter. The point is the number of patterns is linear in the number of neurons. So if I have a thousand neurons, at most I'm gonna store of order, you know, a hundred patterns with this Hoffield model. And that's only if they're all perpendicular. So the big progress in the Hoffield model, and I would say a lot of it actually in the last five, seven years, the most, right? It, there was some progress in the 80s, then it kind of got forgotten. And a lot of it in the last five years has been basically getting around this problem. Like how do I store patterns even if they're correlated? And second, how do I increase the capacity so I can store many more patterns than linearly in the number of neurons or number of spins I'm using? So one thing from the late 80s that was already done by Cantor and Zempelinski was this thing called the projection method. And this projection method was basically a realization that if I thought about the Hoffield model geometrically, then if I wanna think about the projector onto the plane spanned by non-orthogonal patterns, then what I have to do is the actual projector is not just P, P transpose, you can actually just throw in a correlate inverse correlation matrix into this projector, this A mu nu, which is like how correlated are, is pattern mu to nu. And if I throw in this inverse matrix in there, it turns out this is exactly a projector with non-orthogonal bases. So if I ask, if I wanna project on a plane spanned by a bunch of vectors with non or that aren't orthogonal to each other, how do I make the projection? Well, it turns out it's exactly this matrix W. Right? And the reason it wasn't so favorable was that a lot of these ideas were first developed in the context of neuroscience and heavy in learning and, and no one could figure out a biophysically plausible way of getting an inverse matrix. But if you don't care about this neuroscience setting, this is perfectly fine, right? So this is the projection method. And what's nice about it is that if you think about it and once you accept this geometric thing, it turns out that 
There's other order parameters that are really interesting, which I'll call these projections, which are related to the magnetizations, but they're kind of like decorrelated magnetizations. Because every time I multiply by A inverse, I'm like decorrelating stuff. And this gives you a really nice way of mapping things from spin space to pattern space. Because basically, I can just look at the coordinates of this projected part of the thing, and it gives you some. And this is like, these are interesting order parameters. And the energy now, instead of being m mu, is a mu m mu. So it's kind of funny. You change the left and right eigenvectors. But this is kind of generalized order parameters. So this was already done in the 80s, early 90s, I want to say. I want to say late 80s. And then kind of the Hoffield model died. And Dimitri, I think, and basically transformers resurrected this thing. And what Dimitri and John realized was that, look, if I look at this energy in terms of magnetizations, it looks like magnetization squared. But instead, let me take an energy and take this, instead of squaring it, let me take it to the nth power, right? And the idea now is there's much more punishment for being away from this thing. If I'm close to this thing, I really fall into this very steeply. And it turns out now the spin dynamics is just like I flip a spin. And if the energy is lowered, I go in that direction. I accept it, right? So it's just really zero temperature dynamics. And what's really fun is that they point out if I do this mu to the n, right? Now I can store not only linear in n patterns, but I can actually store exponential. I mean, a power law in n patterns. So if before I was linear in n, now whatever this power is, little n, I can store the number of neurons to that nth power, right? So if I choose 10, now I've suddenly gone from, you know, I have 100 neurons. I've gone from being able to store 100 patterns right, to like, you know, whatever, some ridiculous number. <laughs> then people figured out, oh, forget this polynomial. Let me just make this actually exponential. Let me replace this squared by exponential. That's like a sum of all these things. And so this very nice journal of statistical physics paper that for some reason people don't, I don't know. There's a lot of nice papers that people don't cite. I don't know why. <laughs> it's a very beautiful paper, kind of obscure. In, those who love it, love it. Let's put it that way. It's like, it's like bands, right? It's like all the bands I listen to. Those who love them, love them. But now you get exponential number of things in the number of neurons, which is really amazing. And then there was this like really nice paper, which is the Huffield network is all you need. That's where, right? And they generalized this to continuous variables. And they basically related this to transformers, which are like the architecture. So if you know GPT-3, you know Bert, it turns out that a lot of this Huffield model stuff if you put a nonlinearity into the projector, instead of just doing the projector, you do it put through a softmax, turns out to be transformers. And so it's related to what is state-of-the-art language models now, which are dominating everything, right? So there's just really a renaissance. And what's fun is with these modern Hopfield networks, right? You can store many, many things. So you see you're correlated, you put Homer in, you get this back. And this, this, this blog post is actually by the people. They actually wanted people to pay attention. They, it's by the people who wrote this Hoffield network is all you need. So this is one of these nice things in machine learning. Maybe we can adopt in physics. When they write a paper they really care about, they write these really nice pedagogical blog posts that try to explain it to people. And I think I, I, at least, you know, sampling the community, that's really nice. I wish we did that more in biophysics. It would be, it would be nice. We have to figure out how to make the sociological incentives for that. But um, so then they show that if you run all this stuff, you know, it solves all these problems, right? And what's fun is of course now, if I can do it with continuous things, now I don't have to worry about, you know, black and white. I can do it with the original image. I can store all these things like that. So um, that's basically what's going on. I, I'm running out of time. What I want to point out, there's a second resurgence of all this stuff, which is like taking this Hoffield model, which was generally developed in this neuroscience network, uh, in this neuroscience setting, and applying it into different settings. So here is some work from Arvind that I know. That's why I chose it. I like it, where they basically think about associative memory and self-assembling uh, things. This is a really nice series of papers recently where they use these transformer-like ideas to talk about how you navigate and hippocampal grid cells. The stuff I'm gonna talk to you about is that we, about a decade ago, we were thinking about this stuff 
in terms of cellular development. And that's what the talk is going to be about. And I'm going to show you how I got dragged back into this, even though I was vowed I would never work on this again. Because, um, And I'm going to show you the results of that in the next thing. So that's what it is. I think I was almost on time. I'm very happy. That I yeah, you were. <laughs> Great. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Pankaj. I'm going to clap on behalf of the audience. Uh, so we already do have some questions on the chat. Uh, in the chat, sorry. Uh, so uh, you can you can take a look to Pankaj. The so first question is from John. Can you comment on the role of the bias term uh, B sub I? Uh, yeah, uh, I can. Um, what did I want to say? Uh, yeah, um, you can put it in. You cannot put it in. Um, uh, it's not so central to the Hopfield construction, right? So I would say it's under exploited. The place where it is used is in some, another generalization of the Hopfield model that I didn't have time to talk about, which is restricted Boltzmann machines. There they play a more central role, but I would say it's not fundamental to the Hopfield construction. It's just a way of pinning certain things, right? So, um, so I would say it's not super fundamental to the Hopfield model mm -hmm. in, in the way I talked about it. So uh, Miguel Garcia has a question. Are the confusion patterns local minima or they emerge due to the dynamical rule that you define for the spins updates? Are there other definitions of the dynamics that avoid the confusion? Uh, uh, I, think th I think they're very much, um, the dynamics and the construction are very intertwined because basically um, they emerge from the energy landscape. So any dynamics that basically is going to minimize the energy landscape is going to basically give you these confusion patterns, right? It's not really central to the dynamics. They're really the minimum of the energy landscape. It's the first thing. Now, of course, you could imagine I have some dynamics that don't trap you in local minima and do other things. But as I showed in the phase diagram, you're not even guaranteed the patterns you're storing as they start interfering are the global minima. So you can't even use things like annealing because sometimes they become the local minima because they start interfering. And then they then you just get a proliferation of these minima that are mixtures. That's generically what happens in these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Henry has a question. Do the modern Hopfield models require synaptic weight matrices, WIJ, that are unbounded in magnitude? No, 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 no. I mean, the whole idea is you construct the magnetization, mm -hmm. right? So that's whatever the pattern is. So you can store the pattern in Z-score if you want. Then you take the overlap and then you take it to the nth power, you exponentiate it. So they don't require any of that, right? I had a question on the modern Hopfield models too. Let me squeeze that in. So does the does fixing uh, uh, does changing the energy uh, functional take care of the correlated correlations between patterns you're storing too? Uh, you said there were two problems, right? One is that yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to think. Not, not really, not really. I would say. So how is that fixed in the I modern? Mean, it does fix it some. It does, okay. because okay. basically you're basically making, the basic idea is the intuition is that the attractor basins were too shallow, right? If you think about mm -hmm. squared versus N, and so you just didn't flow fast enough. And so the idea is here, you make the thing very steeper. Mm -hmm. And so the, the overlap between the basins, these regions kind of diminishes. So it does take care of it implicitly. The thing that really mm -hmm. does it is this like Hoffield all you need stuff that I didn't have time to talk about. Like I had like five, mm -hmm. 10 slides I took them out because I was mm -hmm. like, there's no way I'm doing this in 25 minutes, but it, 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 it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, Paul, has some... Paul has a question on how, can you comment on how this relates to restricted Boltzmann machines? Are the more yeah, modern? It's kind, of, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. So if you think about the square Hoffield model, right? It's like a restricted Boltzmann machine with a Gaussian, with Gaussian hidden units, right? Dimitri might have a better answer than me. I've been trying to reformulate this as an RBM, right? In some sense, it's clear it is because, because basically once you say it's just the magnetizations, you can always use something like a Fadeev Papa, uh, whatever, I don't know what you call them. I forgot what your background is, Paul. Oh, you're like almost like a real biophysicist. Um, 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 but you can use like whatever, what, what do they call them? I don't know. I, this is where my field theory background comes out. Hubbard Stratonovich, whatever trick you want to decouple these things, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, it looks like a Hopfield model because I can always take M to the N where N is even and then decouple it, right? Yeah, Hubbard Sotranovich thing, right? So if I had N was a power, even power of two, you can imagine it's a stacked Hopfield model <laughs> with hidden layers, right? But I, I, 
And so, and so I think that's the basic idea, right? I mean, in the sense that I think they're much more explicitly closer to the upfield model. Uh, they make much more clear why you're doing the RBMs, because you can imagine just if I have M to the 2N, I decouple it once with a Hubbard Stratonovich, now I get M to the N, M to the N. If everything's a power of two, I could just keep decoupling it. So that's the best I've come up with. So it definitely is related. I think the more interesting thing, again, is this hot field is all you need stuff, this thing that's much closer to transformers. Still thinking through that, thinking through that, you know. Um, like I said, I don't have all the answers. Part of why I want to do these tutorials is this is, I found this stuff exciting. I feel like we don't, we're not talking about it enough. Mm -hmm.